So welcome everyone to um, Sports Medicine Response to COVID-19 webinar hosted by the Center for Sport at Tulane University. Today we have um, with us presenting Dr. Gregory Stewart and Dr. Beth Smith. I'm gonna give a brief introduction to bo uh, both presenters. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. We will be running the question and answer session at the end of the presentations, and that will be done through your Q&A uh, feature at the bottom. So you can type in your questions. Um, feel free to type those in as we go through the presentation, and then we will address those at the end. Also, there is no need for um, an attendance form. We will pull the report for that. So you are good to go on that end. And then we will talk about the credit claiming process at the end of the presentation this morning. So as an introduction, um, Dr. Gregory Stewart is a nationally recognized expert in the non-operative treatment of musculoskeletal disorders in adults. He also specializes in disability prevention rehab medicine, sports medicine, and has a particular interest in sports concussion. Dr. Stewart is the director of the Sports Concussion Management Program and team physician at Tulane University. He served as team physician for professional collegiate and high school teams for more than 30 years. In addition to co-directing the Center for Sport, Dr. Stewart currently spends most of his time working with former professional athletes as medical director of the professional athlete care team at Tulane University. He leads the NFL Benefits Neurological Care Program, NFL Player Care Foundation, Healthy Body and Mind Screening Program, and the TRUST Brain and Body and Milestone Wellness Assessment Program. And then um, Dr. Beth Smith is an instructor at the Tulane School of Medicine and the lead researcher for the Center for Sports Professional Athlete Care Team. Dr. Smith manages the research, including uh, research for the NFL Player Care Foundation Healthy Body and Mind Screening Program. This research focuses on the cardiovascular disease risk of former professional football players, including diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and sleep apnea. Uh, the goal of the research is to advance the scientific understanding of this athlete population and improve their quality of life by providing physicians with valuable information about the unique healthcare needs of retired athletes. So, uh, we welcome both Dr. Stewart and Dr. Smith, and I am going to turn it over. Thank you, Tess. Uh, appreciate uh, your uh, kind introduction, and welcome to everybody uh, to uh, Sports Medicine Response to COVID-19. Uh, this is coming through the uh, Center for Sport uh, at uh, Tulane University. Uh, the center uh, we uh, view the world uh, through the uh, lens of sport and uh, sports impact uh, on the world. And we do this through uh, community engagement, clinical programs, research, uh, and uh, education, uh, which is uh, what we're doing uh, here. So we'll talk about this uh, today. Uh, with the sports medicine uh, reaction, uh, kind of go through a little bit of history. Uh, from a disclosure standpoint, uh, nothing uh, to uh, disclose. Um, objectives for today, really kind of recognize some of the basic science uh, behind uh, the coronavirus, uh, distinguish between the facts and falsehoods, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the return to sport communication, rehabilitation, and clearance. And while we don't really have the, uh, the answers, uh, I think we'll uh, be able to present uh, with some of the questions that we're going to need to be able to, uh, to answer as we go through all of this. Uh, I think that uh, while the, the first case uh, in the United States was on uh, January 20th uh, of this year. Uh, I think we all realized that uh, our world was changing uh, on Wednesday, March 11th, uh, when the NBA uh, stopped. Uh, and I think that's kind of where, from a sports medicine standpoint, we all realized that uh, something was, was going on. That was on March 11th. <clears throat> on uh, Friday, March 13th, uh, I was asked to, to come and talk to 
uh, Tulane football team, it's, we were in spring ball, to talk about this COVID-19 thing that we were just beginning to hear about, what exactly did, uh, did that mean? And at that point, uh, realizing that that's just a little over uh, about four weeks ago, uh, worldwide at that time, there were 127,000 uh, that were sick. Uh, 4,600 had died in the United States. Uh, we had 1,300 cases. Uh, when we gave this talk uh, on, uh, and then talking about the flu at that point, 31 million uh, sick in the United States alone, 300,000 in the hospital, and 30,000 uh, deaths. Then we came back and gave this talk, or similar talk to this on uh, Monday, March 23rd, and at that point, uh, 378,000 sick worldwide, 16,000 had died in the United States, 44,000 sick, uh, 558 had died. Uh, and then as we know, with all this changing, uh, the numbers as of last night, didn't pull them up this morning, worldwide over 2 million sick with 143,000 died. And uh, with my understanding that the uh, Chinese have actually said that the death toll was a, a higher by 50%, uh, those numbers change in the United States. Uh, over 600,000 uh, confirmed sick uh, with uh, 28, close to 30,000 uh, that have uh, died uh, to date. Uh, one of the things I think that as we, we look at all of this uh, and we think about it in terms of some of the seasonal flu, um, the, um, we see that the uh, uh, some of the Fatality, especially in the older individuals, all ages 0.1 to 0.2 percent, uh, in the elderly, uh, maybe 0.8 percent uh, case fatality rate, uh, and seeing uh, in uh, the early days in China uh, that this is easily up to 6 percent, and depending upon uh, where we are. Uh, in the elderly, that this may actually even be uh, higher than that in uh, in some of our um, countries around the world. I think it, at this point, you know, this is kind of what the virus looks like. Uh, COVID uh, stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, uh, and I'm going to to stop for a minute and uh, go into the whole process of uh, and letting letting everyone hear a little bit about the background and the virology uh, in this. All right. Um, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen, the correct screen. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you all for coming uh, and uh, logging in to uh, attend this webinar. Um, and so when Dr. Stewart asked me if I'd be willing to give this talk again, of course I was more than happy. But as I started going through the slides that I gave um, March 23rd, I realized that um, there were some significant changes or, or not necessarily changes, but um, new information that was coming out about the virus that I hadn't covered in the first talk. And so um, this talk's actually going to then be a little bit different for that reason. I'm going to cover some of the same background information, but I'm going to include some new information um, for some of the late breaking uh, research that uh, has recently been published. So. I'll start out by saying that I have no uh, actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose with regards to this program or presentation. And from there, I'll just jump right in. Um, and I'd like to start out by, for those of you who attended last time, um, getting you to recall what we discussed about our previous, um, you know, previously about uh, what constitutes a virus. And so without going into all of that again, I just wanna um, really underline this idea that viruses are really only able to multiply within the cells of a living host. And that's because they don't carry any of their own molecular machinery or cellular machinery with them. Uh, and instead, they actually hijack their host machinery for the purpose of generation of proteins um, and then the construction of new progeny viruses. However, it doesn't mean that these viruses don't actually have mechanisms to ensure their own survival and propagation. 
Um, while I'm not going to go through all of those mechanisms because there are numerous mechanisms, the one I really want to point out is here, um, that some of these viruses can actually change by the process of mutagenesis. And the reason I'm going to talk about that one specifically is because coronaviruses are master mutators. Um, this has um, very much to do with the type of genome that they have, a single-stranded RNA genome um, that makes them um, particularly suspect or um, capable of uh, mutating. So I'll also revisit this slide that I talked about last time. And this is basically just the, the basic background behind uh, viral infection, in particular infection by envelope viruses. And basically what happens in this case is uh, these envelope viruses are covered on their surface by glycoproteins. And these proteins, <clears throat> or at least a subset of them, are, are used to, um, in some ways, like a molecular key to access the host cell by interacting acting with a cellular receptor on the surface of the cell. If you'll recall, uh, we talked about, and you've probably heard in the news, um, for coronaviruses, this surface molecular key is the spike glycoprotein, and specifically, which we did not talk about last time, the S1 subunit, so the most distal portion of that virus. Um, and this, the very end of that S1 subunit contains something called the receptor binding domain. And each of these receptor binding domains contains three receptor binding motifs, uh, each one capable of interacting with a cellular receptor. And so what happens is this cellular, sorry, this uh, viral receptor binding domain essentially grabs on to the cellular receptor, which induces the cell to take in not only the receptor, but also the virus. What happens once this endosome has encapsulated essentially uh, the virus and the receptor, uh, the S2 subunit, the portion of the subunit closer to the virus, um, actually kicks in and does its magic, which is to cause binding of the, um, the viral envelope with the cellular membrane. Um, this is actually known as the, on the S2 subunit is actually known as the viral fusion machine. Um, and I bring it up because it's going to come into um, this talk later on. Um, once this uh, membrane fusion happens, the nucleocapsid, which contains the genetic material of the virus, is released into the host cell where it then has access to the host cell's uh, translational machinery for the generation of proteins and ultimately the, the building of progeny variants. So um, <clears throat> if you'll recall, the SARS coronavirus 2, which is the name of this virus, um, actually utilizes the host cell's angiotensin converting enzyme 2 on its receptor to gain entry. Um, and the, the big important part of this, though, is that um, two things have to be in place for this coronavirus to infect a cell. And the first is that the virus must contain a functional spike glycoprotein. Um, and then the second is that the cell that's being targeted for entry must express um, ACE2 in order to be infected. So the spike glycoprotein as a highly conserved virulence factor that's present on the surface of the viral particles is typically considered a major target for the immune system and the production of neutralizing antibodies. Um, and this is because um, when antibodies bind to the spike glycoprotein, they can effectively block either the binding of the virus to its host cell or um, actual release of the virus into the cell um, with an antibody bound that uh, fusion mechanism can no longer function. Um, so usually what we see, and if you were not aware of this before, I'm sure you are now with the amount that it's been in the news, um, usually once a host has been infected and successfully mounted an immune response that's adequate to, eliminating, to eliminate an infecting pathogen, um, the immune system will readily then recognize that same pathogen upon secondary infection. And usually it's capable of neutralizing it before it even is able, the pathogen is even able to make us sick. This is the whole basis behind vaccination. Um, that's the whole idea uh, behind exposing individuals to either parts of a virus or a killed virus um, to allow the immune system to be able to recognize it and to have lasting immunity. So then knowing that, what on earth 
is going on in South Korea and Japan, and uh, even though it's not in the headlines, China, um, where we're seeing actual um, uh, relapse of COVID-19 patients that were sick, then recovered, and even tested negative for um, viral PCR, um, relapsing with symptoms or um, being able to detect viral RNA again. And so there's three potential possibilities um, or explanations for what's happening here. And I'm gonna explain and go into a little bit of detail on all three of them, but the first one is reinfection. So the, the first possibility is that these individuals were reinfected by another maybe slightly different strain of the virus. The second possibility is reactivation. So it's possible that this virus sort of um, went dormant in its host and was kind of hiding from the host immune system and then for whatever reason uh, reactivated and created a new infection. And then the third possibility is that these individuals were never technically uh, negative at all. Um, they are negative. The PCR tests were results of false negative PCR um, results in which viral, uh, sorry, RNA was not detected. So a little bit about this potential for reinfection. Um, you know, we talked about the immune system targeting specifically the spike glycoprotein, and this causes the spike, so the spike glycoprotein to be highly subject to immune-mediated selective pressure. Um, in, in this situation, what's happening is that um, the immune system is recognizing and neutralizing viruses or pathogens based on specific parts of the pathogen called epitopes. Um, and so in this case, it's specific parts of the spike glycoprotein um, called an epitope. Um, and the idea being, as we discussed, that upon second exposure, the host antibody response would then bind to these epitopes and block the virus from being able to infect its host cell. So what's happening is that the host immune system is actually actively selecting against any viruses that contain these recognizable epitopes. Um, in fact, any viruses that contain epitopes that can be recognized by the host immune system are then bound by antibodies and prevented from, like I said, either attaching or entering cells. Um, however, one of the things that can happen, especially in viruses that mutate quite readily, is that these um, epitopes can potentially change, and now only viruses that either lack the recognizable epitopes or that have relatively small changes in the ep these epitopes will be able to enter the cells in order to create, uh, replicate and create progeny virus. So I um, <clears throat> mostly show this slide because I wanna point out this top figure um, where it shows antibody binding sites. Um, and this is, this is so that I can point out how really small in comparison to the rest of the protein structure an antibody binding site is. In some cases, only maybe a few hundred residues or amino acids. Um, and that's because really what antibodies recognize is protein structure. And that becomes very important in understanding viral mutagenesis and evasion of the immune system because it only requires um, a couple of amino acid changes to potentially change the structure enough that either an antibody can no longer recognize that epitope at all, or if the antibody still recognizes that epitope, the binding affinity or the tightness with which an antibody can bind its epitope is reduced enough that even if the, the antibody does bind its, epi its viral epitope, it will readily release it, thus releasing the virus to be able to infect cells, um, even if a host has already been infected once and recovered. Um, with all this doom and gloom talk, though, I do want to point out that um, there are studies um, in individuals that were infected and recovered from the 2003 SARS coronavirus as well as the MERS coronavirus um, that suggest that their lasting immunity was actually fairly robust um, and lasted anywhere from one year in the MERS coronavirus to as much as three or more years for the 2003 SARS coronavirus. So it's not all um, hopeless, so to speak. Um, the second possibility then that, that is discussed is the possibility of reactivation. And what we're talking about here is a situation in which a viral infection that was maybe not completely cleared by the host can allow virus in some cases to enter a host cell and basically become latent. 
what happens um, or what's going on with latent virus is that it's really just kind of, it goes dormant. It's, lay, it's laying low in a cell. It's not really replicating. Um, it's kind of hiding from the immune system. Um, there is plenty of precedent for this, um, particularly in the herpes viridae family, um, which statistics say 99% of us are familiar with because this includes herpes simplex one, which causes cold sores. Um, the life cycle of these viruses includes a latent cycle. Um, as I'm sure anybody who has cold sores is aware, you'll get a cold sore, it'll regress and go away, you won't have any for a, a, a while and then it'll emerge again. Um, other, other herpes viruses that also do this include the varicella zoster virus, which is the chicken pox virus, um, as well as the Epstein-Barr virus. So there is precedent for this occurring. So in a study of, I believe it was 35, recovered 2019 SARS coronavirus, two patients um, found that these patients that were hospitalized um, had tested positive for COVID-19, um, recovered, tested negative by PCR for viral RNA and were sent home. However, within four to 17 days of having tested negative, they then either redeveloped new symptoms or without developing symptoms, tested positive again for um, viral RNA. And so the study authors actually, um, as opposed to attributing this to reinfection with a new virus, attributed what they were seeing in these patients to reactivation of latent virus. And their reasoning for this is that they stated that um, reactivation was considered more likely because of the time frame in which this happened, stating that they felt that four to 17 days was not sufficient enough time for them to have um, interacted with a mutated or a different strain of this virus and then redeveloped uh, disease. And um, this is actually a peer reviewed article. So apparently um, other peer reviewers agreed with them. Um, however, I remain skeptical because, um, so I have a background in coronavirus virology, um, and there are a few examples, um, particularly in human coronaviruses, of them actually just completely going latent and lying dormant um, after recovery. Uh, in fact, the closest thing that we see um, to latency uh, with coronaviruses uh, occurs um, in addition to other coronaviruses but particularly with feline coronaviruses. So any of you out there who have cats are probably familiar with FIP or feline infectious peritonitis virus. And this is actually caused by a feline coronavirus that infects usually kittens and uh, actually causes a persistent infection. And so this is different from latent infection because a in persistent infection is where a viral infection is very low level, but the virus is actually actively replicating, actively infecting these cells, but is generally so low level that the animal remains asymptomatic, which is what we see. Um, in FIP, what actually happens is that that coronavirus that is causing persistent infection mutates and then causes highly pathogenic infection. Um, so based on that fact, it's actually considered even more likely that what we are seeing in this regard, um, at least what happened with these patients in Wuhan, um, was that their initial negative test results were actually results of false negative PCR tests. And so any of you out there who might have some background in molecular biology who have ever worked with RNA know that RNA is particularly difficult to work with, um, especially RNA that's recovered in single tube tests, so where they're recovering um, the RNA, they're creating a cDNA, then they're amplifying it within a single tube. Um, there is actually a threshold, a minimum threshold for detection of RNA, and even though these tests are generally considered to be very sensitive, it is possible that um, in these individuals, the amount of virus that was recovered or the amount of RNA that could be recovered um, was particularly low and could not be detected by the test. Um, and so that is the third possibility. And in my personal opinion, outside of um, those inter individuals interacting with a mutated strain of the virus is probably more likely what happened. So going back to this idea of selective pressure by the immune system or genetic drift is what that's referring to. Um, is, there's a lot of question is, is the spike glycoprotein then still a good candidate for vaccine design? 
Um, and the short answer is yes, absolutely 100%. What we typically find in individuals that have an antibody response um, and develop polyclonal antibodies and, and recover from viruses, that this is what their antibodies are targeting. Um, however, in the design of a vaccine, um, thoughtful targeting of the most optimal epitopes of the spike glycoprotein is going to be vital in order to convey long-lasting immunity. Um, and there's a lot of hope here because that paper that was published, um, this group, Walls and uh, Associates, uh, published, I believe, at the end of March of this year, um, found that there was considerable homology um, of the S2, so here we go, that fusion machinery portion of the spike glycoprotein between the 2003 SARS coronavirus and the new 2019 SARS-2 coronavirus. Um, so to test this, to test what they were finding, to determine if these uh, epitopes um, were actually being used to generate antibodies, what they did is they isolated the SARS-2, uh, sorry, the 2003 SARS coronavirus spike glycoprotein, inoculated it into mice, gave those mice 10 to 14 days to develop an immune response and then collected serum from those mice. They then, they then took that serum, treated cells in culture that were permissive for SARS coronavirus infection um, with the serum from those mice and then tried to infect those cells with the 2019 SARS-2 coronavirus. And what they found was that there was a significant amount of what we refer to as cross neutralization. Um, in that the antibodies that were generated by the mice against the 2003 SARS coronavirus effectively blocked infection by the 2019 SARS-2 coronavirus. It was a second paper that did something very similar to this. Um, what they did is they actually uh, isolated or took a convalescent sera, so serum from patients that had recovered from the 2003 SARS coronavirus and did a similar experiment, used that serum to treat cells that were permissive for SARS coronavirus infection, and then tried to infect them with the 2019 SARS-2 coronavirus. And what they reported was that they found moderate but significant cross-neutralization, again, of the SARS-2, the 2019 coronavirus, by antibodies that were taken from individuals that had had the 2003 SARS coronavirus. So what does this mean then? It means that it, there is a high likelihood that not only can we develop an effective vaccine against the SARS-2 coronavirus by targeting the um, S2 subunit, but that we could actually potentially create a vaccine that recognizes multiple coronaviruses so that we could vaccinate not only against the 2003 coronavirus, should it reemerge, or this 2019 coronavirus, we could potentially vaccinate against future emerging uh, SARS coronaviruses um, that would help to prevent another pandemic like this in the future, at least coronavirus related. So the scientific community continues to study and understand the origin, infectivity, and immunogenic properties of this new virus, as well as viable and effective treatment options for individuals that have already been infected. Uh, in fact, there are multiple vaccine studies that are currently underway, um, and clinical trials on those have actually even already begun in multiple countries. Um, and if you're interested in seeing any of those, our information on any of those clinical trials, um, this website, centerwatch.com, is great. Um, it lists all the clinical trials that are going on currently in the United States. And actually, as of Wednesday, there were 189, which is an amazing number, given that this really only kicked off at the end of February, uh, COVID-19-related clinical trials underway in the United States to study everything from um, COVID-19 therapies for individuals that have already been infected to studying populations to understand their responses to this pandemic. Last but not least, I would be remiss if I failed to mention um, the $10 million NIH grant that was recently awarded to Dr. Chad Roy of the Tulane National Primate Research Study to uh, study this virus and perhaps even most importantly, to help develop a non-human primate model of SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Um, having this would help to facilitate um, studies to help us further understand uh, viral infection because there is currently no primate model, much less, um, and not even really a very good animal model of infection. 
um, and having a non-human non primate model would help us to be able to test the efficacy of potential vaccines because as I hope all of you are aware, while we can test the safety of vaccines on human subjects, um, we cannot ethically test the efficacy of these vaccines um, by exposing individuals to um, live active virus. So on this note, I will turn this back over to Dr. Stewart and let him continue to talk about the uh, uh, sports community's response to COVID-19. All right, <clears throat> thank you. So we'll continue on with, with this. And some of what I wanna do is to also kind of go over um, just kind of what we're seeing uh, with, uh, with all of this. Some of this is still uh, data that's based on uh, what was going on in uh, China during the early parts. Uh, but as you see here, uh, as we go through and, and we talk about this, you know, there's approximately 2.3% of all the individuals that are infected died. As you kind of come down this pyramid, you have the critical cases, severe cases that had significant symptoms, uh, a number of mild cases that may well have just been uh, individuals who snotty nose, just didn't feel good, ran a fever. And then there's this bottom piece that we have no idea what the, what the volume of this is uh, with regard to those that have not been identified, not been diagnosed. Uh, and some of that's just because of the way that we're doing uh, the testing uh, or not doing the testing uh, in different areas. When we look at this, the mean incubation period is about five to six days, uh, we think, uh, and has a range anywhere between one to 14 days. Uh, which is why the different quarantine is a, a minimum of 14 days, uh, we think. Uh, and because of some of the, the things that you've heard with the disease coming back or uh, becoming uh, not latent or whatever, uh, we think that on average the disease lasts about uh, two weeks uh, from its onset uh, to clinical recovery, uh, at least in the mild cases. Uh, severe and critical cases, uh, three to six weeks. Um, and for those who eventually died, the time from symptom onset to death ranged anywhere from two to eight weeks. And I think the thing that for us in sports medicine becomes even more important is that this recovery can be much longer. And we're just beginning to, to see what this recovery looks like, especially in individuals who had developed some sort of, uh, of pneumonia. Still, the, the major uh, symptoms are fever, uh, dry cough and fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, uh, some of the things that we looked at, but uh, there's an increasing uh, number of individuals who are starting uh, with GI complaints uh, and even the loss of smell as being some of the first uh, uh, symptoms uh, that we're seeing in these individuals. The early case fatality rates, and this is still holding true, uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension especially, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, chronic respiratory disease, uh, these seem to be the uh, comorbid conditions that individuals uh, all have that have the highest level uh, of fatality, uh, no health conditions, uh, down around you know, 0.9% uh, or 1% uh, in this. The age group, as you go and look at this as well, um, some of this has changed a little bit, but not a whole lot. And the younger uh, aged individuals, uh, very low rate uh, of uh, death. Uh, and then those, as you get older, a uh, significantly higher rate uh, of death. Uh, and this becomes important as you look at the share of the population that's 70 years and older in different countries. Uh, Italy, which has really been particularly hard hit uh, with a high incidence of uh, individuals uh, over the age of 70. Uh, and these are some of the ones that are certainly more vulnerable uh, with regard to, to what we're seeing. 
as you look at this by age, the case fatality rates uh, and the, the countries that we have to, to look at are South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy. Especially as you get older, what you see here is that uh, even by age, 80 plus, uh, Italy has uh, a case fatality rate of over 20%, South Korea uh, in the range of 13%. So there's some differences uh, in countries uh, and whether some of this has to do with testing uh, and how many people are tested, but there's also something else that's going on that I don't think anybody completely uh, understands uh, at this point. Daily new confirmed uh, cases, uh, again, I'm, we're, just on most of these pull up the world, uh, the United States, uh, Italy, because they've really been in the news in China. You can see early on with some of the spike uh, of what was going on in, uh, in China, some of our first cases here, and kind of where we are uh, in the United States and even in the world. As you look at this uh, trends here, uh, as they start talking about bending the curve and things like that, this is some of what we're, we're looking at. And a lot of times they're using three and five day uh, averages in order to, to look at this. Confirmed cases in the world uh, continues to, to go up uh, over uh, 2 million cases uh, at this point. This really just kind of looks at uh, death uh, per million uh, people. Uh, uh, Europe is especially hard hit. Uh, United States, uh, Iran are also uh, been hard hit in all this. And what we don't know is the is how well individuals are reporting uh, all of their numbers. Uh, confirmed deaths uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, again, uh, some of this China just changed some of their numbers. Uh, what we don't have in the United States, and you were hearing coming out of New York, is that they could have easily had up to 200 individuals a day dying at home. Uh, that weren't getting counted. Uh, so this number is going to change uh, over time as we have a better feel for, for what's going on. I think one of the things that becomes important to look at uh, in this, and here we are, and this is uh, kind of an exposure. So in an individual who has COVID-19 uh, is, to the best of our understanding of this, uh, infects 2.5 other individuals. You go back to some of the other MERS, uh, less than one normal influenza, 1.5. Measles is 16. Uh, come mumps, 4.5, which we were dealing with uh, this past school year at the, at the beginning. So I think it becomes important to, to look and realize kind of what that in, uh, in potential infection rate is, is uh, also. Pull this up, just kind of compare this you know, the bubonic plague uh, back in the 1300s, kind of over 200 million died. This is the one that I pulled up early um, at the last talk uh, where it was less than Ebola and uh, now over Ebola approaching uh, the level of uh, yellow fever. Um, again, looking at the, the history of pandemics and where they've come through, uh, comparison to HIV, uh, Spanish flu back in uh, 1918, uh, and this is the coronavirus again uh, at the beginning when I gave this talk about two weeks ago, and here it is now again uh, with, the, with the change. So it's probably still going to continue to, to kind of ramp up uh, because we're still in that uh, kind of at the peak of everything. When they talk about flattening the curve, really all they're, they're trying to do is that there's a certain capacity of the healthcare system to treat individuals. So we've done social distancing and things like that. Uh, not to, to some extent, drop the total number, but to make sure that what we're doing is falls within the capacity of our healthcare system. So a lot of this has just been to make sure that we have enough hospital beds, enough ventilators, uh, enough healthcare workers, uh, in order to uh, deal with, uh, with all of this. Some of the best practices, you know, initially uh, we thought social distancing of six feet uh, was where we needed to be. Uh, now there's some uh, talk and discussion, this may well be 13 feet uh, to, to really be able to, to have the adequate social distancing. Talk about hand washing, uh, should do this and sing the entire happy birthday song uh, while you're washing your hands, hand sanitizer, uh, at least 70% alcohol. 
you know, initially this was coughing or sneezing into the elbow. Uh, and now we're even saying, oh my gosh, now if you actually have the virus and it stays on, on your clothes, that this needs to be a tissue that can be disposed of in uh, uh, a waste can that has a top uh, to it. But even as we've done that, we're now coming back and realizing that uh, individuals that are in hospitals uh, on the front line, uh, as they're walking from room to room, are actually carrying the coronavirus on the soles of their shoes uh, and needing to do stuff with regard to disinfecting that. And that it can live on hard surfaces for uh, an extended period of time. So. Uh, I'm not sure gloves are the way to go that you see so many people wearing gloves because they're really just continuing to spread it as well. Uh, but we need to be thinking about that as we do um, hand washing and hand sanitizer and everything else and, and working on, uh, on all of that. As far as families go, uh, I think this becomes important because most everybody on here, we're not just dealing with ourselves, we're dealing with our coaching staffs, we're dealing with our athletes, we're dealing with the teams. Uh, even though they're dispersed, we're the ones that, uh, that they're coming to. So we need to keep in mind that uh, the vulnerable uh, and the most vulnerable, are even more vulnerable now, uh, individuals, uh, with domestic violence, child abuse situations. I'm sure we all have uh, student athletes uh, that actually are much better in spite of the fact that they probably shouldn't be on campus. They're probably better off on campus than, than they are going back to their home situation. Food insecurity, financial peril. I think we need to make sure that as we're talking with our coaching staffs and everything that we normalize some of the frustrations and conflicts that we're dealing with. Realize that even within uh, home, uh, we need to encourage uh, breaks uh, from each other uh, and help people set reasonable expectations for themselves uh, as well uh, during this time. For ourselves, uh, I think sleep, nutrition, making sure we stay connected. Uh, I'm sure we've all done this as we do our Zoom calls and everything. We've started telling people they have to open up their videos so that everybody can see each other exercise of some sort, ideally outdoors, but with social distancing, uh, maintaining a routine, uh, avoiding information overload, turning the TV off, not looking at the phone, kind of staying away from some of this and, and taking breaks uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis. It's easy to be at home and in our offices and doing stuff and forgetting that there's now an end to our day uh, as, uh, as we move forward. As we look at some of the medical concerns, and this comes back to, to how do we open up, and I think we're gonna have more questions and I'm gonna have answers for you. I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that in the 1918 pandemic uh, with the flu, uh, the Spanish flu, that the second wave actually killed more individuals than the first wave did. Uh, granted, it was the end of World War I. We had uh, soldiers coming back from uh, the European theater uh, and spreading this, but at the same time, the war was over and uh, people kind of stopped with social distancing. So I think we need to keep in mind that uh, at some point in this, given the fact that we don't have uh, uh, good medications right now, we don't have a vaccine, that there's liable to be some level of a second wave. And that I think becomes something that we're really gonna have to pay attention to as we're uh, moving forward and uh, talking with uh, our coaching staffs and our universities and, and uh, leagues and organizations. When we do come back, uh, I think we're gonna have to realize that there's gonna be some issues with regard to deconditioning, even in the individuals who are not infected, um, even though we've got virtual OTAs in the NFL, uh, I can't imagine that the virtual OTAs are, they're going to be working to the same extent that they would be if they were actually on site. So we're going to have to keep that in mind and continue to work with this. And individuals who have had a more severe um, involvement, and, I'm, and we don't know this right now, but as you talk with individuals and young, healthy individuals in their 20s and 30s, who were infected and had more than just the, the runny nose, that this recovery period is really taking a long time, that they're fatigued, that they're having breathing issues significantly longer than, than what you would normally expect. 
So what does that mean when they come back? Uh, we're going to have to look at individuals. Is there lung damage? Is this some part of pulmonary function studies? So we're doing ultrasound. We'll look at the, the lungs uh, and see what's going on. Um, there's a, a myocarditis that goes along with this. And I think we've got to keep in mind, do we have to, to go back and are we doing EKGs on, uh, on everybody? Uh, at this point? Are we doing something else uh, from that standpoint as well? And I also think that the thing that we've got to keep in mind with this, and this comes back to my time when we were doing the H1N1 flu uh, with everyone, that there was really a lot of uh, psychological stress, even with the athletes. Uh, I had some athletes that would come to practice with the mask on, and, and it wasn't even something that was accepted at that time, and now everyone's kind of wearing the mask. So we're going to have individuals that are coming out of isolation. We're going to have to think about the mental health aspect of, of just the athletes and coming back and what does that mean uh, with regard to, to what they're doing. I think as we're doing this return, um, we're all going to be involved in, in this. Um, so I think that there's got to be pre-return pre uh, preparation. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we're going to have to be ready for all of this to, to start up and, and be prepared for whatever it is that that means. We're going to have stages of all this. They're going to be returning to campus. We're going to have to return to the athletics buildings. Um, some level of uh, getting back in shape in summer workouts. And, and this goes back, those of you who are old enough, uh, I certainly am, uh, where remember when uh, the uh, football, they would show up in the morning, we'd do physicals and we'd do the first practice that afternoon and did, we'd do two weeks of two-a-days. Uh, and they weren't there uh, all summer long. So it can be done, but what does that mean? Uh, we've got to get up to some sort of preseason practice load, and then we've got to think about uh, what's going to happen in, uh, with regard to competition. In this pre-return planning, I think we've got to get the general counsel involved. We've got to have risk management involved. Uh, each of our universities, our organizations, our high schools, whatever, uh, is going to have some uh, team that's going to plan on what's going on. Uh, so you need to have someone on that team, but I think there also has to be uh, an action team within athletics, uh, and that's going to start with the athletic director. It's going to start, uh, obviously, with the sports medicine folks, but strength and conditioning is going to have to be involved. Uh, facilities is going to have to be involved. Equipment's going to have to be involved. The coaching staff, all these people are going to need to be involved. And we're going to go back and we're going to look to the CDC, uh, the NCAA, and some of these other uh, organizations uh, for uh, guidance in all of this. So uh, keep tabs of what they're saying and what's going on in, in the advisory groups. And, and the PPE, this isn't the pre-participation physical exam uh, on this one. This is the personal protective equipment. Uh, we're going to have to have that. I know at Tulane, uh, we picked up uh, most of ours and gave it over to the hospitals because the hospitals are running short. But we're going to have to have this equipment uh, for our staff uh, and for facilities. So we've got to get back and figure out how we're going to order it. What exactly do we need? Uh, a plan to, to disinfect uh, all the facilities. And once the facilities are disinfected and we go through the facilities, how often after that do we need to, to disinfect and, and purify? Not just the clothing. Uh, and gear, but also the, the facilities. And as we're doing all of this, we're all going to have to go back and look at our emergency action plans uh, because we've got to keep in mind that some of the clinics that we may have used are closed. Our main clinic that we see our former professional athletes in has been closed now for, for four weeks. Our sports medicine clinic is open, but we're on a skeleton crew. So are the clinics available uh, for us to get back into? Is the standard EMS and transportation that we were normally working with, are they the ones uh, that are gonna be able to continue to work with us? Or do we need some sort of alternate transportation? And what hospitals do we use? Uh, right now, Tulane Hospital, uh, that would have been our major hospital to send people to, primarily is set up treating uh, COVID patients uh, on ventilators and off of ventilators, and they're not really not even accepting uh, patients that aren't. So we need to think about uh, what are our alternatives 
uh, for uh, all of the things that we kind of take for granted uh, at this point. As we return to campus with our student athletes, and, and we need to be involved with this from the standpoint of whether it's student health or risk management, we're gonna to have to have a protocol for daily checks uh, of our athletes and personnel is that temperature checks. Are we bringing everybody all back at once? Are we bringing them in? Uh, is there gonna be a, a 10, 14 day period that we slowly bring people in so that we can do this? Are we testing everybody? Uh, which means that we're going to have to have virus test kits uh, available to us as, as we're testing symptomatic individuals. Is the testing for antibodies even going to be available at this point? And is it going to work? And is it going to be something that, that we can use? And once we do that, uh, do individuals who test positive for the antibody have less restrictions than those who haven't tested positive? I was talking with uh, our athletic trainers this morning do, if football comes back, do we have to have a full uh, face shield all of a sudden that we're going to put on to uh, all of these helmets? And on the returning physicals, as they do come back on all of our athletes, what are the extra questions that we need to ask? What are the extra tests that we need to do? We talked about that earlier with pulmonary function studies, uh, ultrasound. Is that what we're going to do? And you know, everybody's coming from somewhere else. Um, you know, our athletes are, are sent back all across the country, as I'm sure everybody else's are, or at the high school level, at least across uh, a wide region. So everyone's coming from somewhere else. Do we have to quarantine? What does that look like? Uh, how are we going to quarantine our athletes when they do come back, if that's something that, uh, that we need to do? And then the whole thing with social distancing, is it six feet, is it 13 feet? Uh, what, all, uh, what all does that look like as we're starting to, to bring people back in? Again, talk about workouts and, and practices back to kind of the good old days where you just kind of showed up for two a days. But we know now the importance of coming back uh, and having an acclimatization period where we're really looking and trying to get them ready. We know in some of the others and looking at some of the old studies from the NFL, from the lockout and everything, that when they were gone for a long period of time, even when they came back uh, from uh, having done some workouts and off-season stuff, they still had a higher incidence of soft tissue injuries. So what does this look like? The other thing that we're going to have to keep in mind with all of this is now all of a sudden when we, when we have people coming back, some of these people are going to get sick. Some of our student athletes are going to get sick. Some of our coaching staff and personnel is going to get sick. Do we have an isolation unit? What does that plan look like? Where are we going to do it? Before we were sending everybody home at Tulane, we had a house set up uh, right on the edge of campus that student health was kind of monitoring uh, and kind of setting people up if they started to get uh, symptomatic. Uh, while we were waiting at that point the five days for the testing to come back as opposed to the 15 or 20 minutes that we we have now but if they're positive where do we put them who watches over them how long do we keep them there and if that starts to happen we almost are going to need an infectious disease uh, response team to really do the cluster and, and really do the contact analysis and find out where everything's going and now what are we going to do with our lockers uh, and our locker rooms with everyone coming in and, and with social distancing and the showers and the weight room and meeting rooms and the training room and taping and uh, everything else that, that goes on. We've got to keep that in mind. And now what are we going to do about uh, sanitary hydration with water bottles out on the, on the field? Is this something that we can do? Can we use the cows like we used to do that? What are we going to do with the cooling tanks and the, the towels and, and everything else? Uh, as we as we look at all of this. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we've got to have uh, uh, in place as we think about it. And then when we get back to the whole point of competition and we actually open up and, and are competing, how are we going to do that? Because uh, right now, uh, if uh, we're playing the University of Wyoming, who may be coming out and New Orleans is under a, a travel ban and a quarantine, we can't get there. Uh, but if you're University of Wyoming and we get there, what do you do with us? Do you screen the visiting team uh, when they come in? And sure enough, they're going to be there for a couple of days. What happens if someone from the visiting team gets sick? Uh, and now all of a sudden you have to do that because you're not going to put them back on the team plane uh, and send them home. How are you going to manage that? 
And then don't forget about the fans because at some point we're all gonna be asked that question with regard to this. And while it may be fine to sell every third or fourth seat and do some sort of social distancing in the stands, these people still got to get in and out of the stadium. They got to get in and out of the arena. They're going to go um, stand, uh, buy concessions. They're going to go to the restroom. How are we going to manage uh, some of those things as as uh, as we go away with all this? So I guess really what I'm what I'm saying in all this with the tech takeaways are we're going to have to expect the unexpected. Um, you know, we really don't have an idea as to to what's going on. Uh, at uh, at this point. You know, the stuff that I brought up is really just some of the things that we've started thinking about and started looking at from the standpoint of uh, athletics. And that's both at the high school level, the collegiate level. Uh, we do professional rugby. What about the individuals that have uh, retired from all of that? So I think the thing to, to understand is that today, no one has those answers. Um, and we really don't have any idea what tomorrow will bring. Go back and look at those early um, slides that we put up and how quickly those numbers have changed and how everything has changed even here uh, within, the, um, uh, within the United States with regard to, uh, to what we're doing. So I think that becomes part of this as well. And we're going to have to keep that in mind uh, as, uh, as we move forward, that this is going to have to be a very... Um, fluid, uh, quick thinking type of uh, process as we go through and realize that even once we think we have the answers uh, and we have everything set up, it's going to change uh, and uh, we're going to get thrown uh, a curveball that, uh, that we're really not expecting. So at this point, I uh, want to, to say thank you. We'll take questions. I think uh, Tess is going to uh, run the uh, question side of, uh, of all of this. Uh, and uh, Tess tells me, I know it's noon. If people need to, to get off, um, I guess a couple of things. One is Tess tells me we have the room uh, until uh, 1230, so we can do questions for five or 10 minutes uh, easily. I think the other thing that on our end that we've talked about is that as this evolves and continues to change um, and leagues and conferences and, and uh, organizations start putting things out uh, and there come some, some conversations with uh, best practices uh, that we're probably going to come back and have to do this very thing with updates again uh, in another couple of weeks. So uh, as as I'm sure Tess will tell you in the next slide with some upcoming things as, as we kind of pass up with the questions, uh, I think uh, kind of keep track of all of this because we're going to come back. All right. So thank you both to the presenters. Um, I'm just going to run through the questions as they came in order. All right. So and then I don't know, you guys can decide whoever you think best should answer it. Um, the per first question, if patients can test negative but still be infected, what do you believe standards of quarantine should look like during and after an individual is infected then eventually tests negative? Uh, and I think some of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my best guess and then I'm going to kind of back off and see what other answer we can get. Um, I, I think some of this as we go along, um, I think the testing is going to get better because uh, I do think that some of what we're seeing is um, uh, testing that's giving us uh, false negatives uh, as opposed to, to, to being true negatives on, on some of these people, at least I hope so, because if it's not that, then, then we're in for all sorts of, of trouble from a, an infectious disease standpoint. Uh, but I think that what we're going to see um, is that the testing is going to get better, just like it's gone from five days now to 15 minutes, maybe five minutes. Uh, I think the testing is going to get better. Uh, and I also think we'll see the antibody testing come out. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, that as that happens, that's where we see. Good. Other thoughts? Uh, I, I agree. And, you know, I would say I'm, I'm hoping that as people recover, they're not just resuming their normal lives. Um, I think that 
part of what's going to need to happen is we're going to have to continue testing those individuals based on the fact that it's possible to have a false negative until you have a viral titer that's maybe high enough to be able to detect again. Um, so in an individual that was not completely recovered. So maybe they get home from the hospital or if they never went to the hospital, they were home the entire time, they're not quarantined for just two weeks. They're quarantined for a month. And then after two weeks, you start you know, maybe weekly testing, but that's gonna rely on um, more testing being available. Um, but I think that's gonna be an absolute necessity. And I think a lot of people um, agree with that fact that we need to be doing lots more testing and not just on individuals we suspect might be uh, infected, but on the recovered and on even people who think they've just been exposed and aren't showing symptoms. And, and I think what you're hearing in all of this is the same argument that's going out uh, everywhere else is that uh, while uh, there is an infectious disease public health component to this where we know that there's some absolutes, the flip side to this as well is, you know, what does the fall look without football? Um, it, you know, it was, uh, you know, it kind of hit us basketball, baseball season, okay. Uh, but, you know, I know we have people from all over the country, but in southeastern United States, football is king. Uh, and what does the fall look like without football? And are you willing to take some additional risks um, that aren't necessarily, you um, uh, infectious disease, public health prudent. Um, and I think that's kind of where, where a lot of this is. Okay. Um, all right, so Dr. Stewart, this one is for you. Based on the 2011 NFL lockout Achilles injury study, do you believe that you, uh, there will be an influx of non-contact injuries due to the detraining again with this? It, yeah, I mean, I think that's um, I, I think that's going to be one of the things that that uh, we have to pay very close attention to, um, and, and I think we're going to see that uh, all over. I think that's some of why we've kind of gone to this year round, even though we try and do the periodization, still some of this year round training uh, with what's going on. Um, so yes, I think we're going to see some of that. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out what the middle ground is. And I, I think it's, you know, hamstrings, Achilles, it's going to be a lot of the, the soft tissue stuff. All right. Um, should we be incorporating any biomechanical screening to possibly identify those who are at an increased risk of injury due to the C training? I, yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, I, I think we're going more and more to that anyway, where we're doing some uh, uh, kind of some biomechanical screenings at the at the beginning. I, I think that I think that's something that we're going to see more and more of. And I think as as um, kind of the, the sports medicine world kind of evolves into a little more of a performance health model where, uh, you know, you've got nutrition and mental health and sports medicine and strength and conditioning and, and everybody kind of a little more uh, together. Uh, I think we're gonna see more and more of that. Um, and this may be the, the uh, exactly what we needed in order to pull all that together. Okay. Um, where do things stand at this point for any rapid, a type of rapid test or test that you could have available in athletic training rooms? You know, I, I, I think, yeah, I like the look on the face there. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, some of this stuff that's going on and, you know, we're seeing more of the rapid testing. I have no idea what the cost is. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, we've already started talking about is that we haven't done like the rapid testing for flu and strep in the, in the training room. And, and we're fortunate at Tulane that our uh, physician uh, uh, offices, the Tulane Institute of Sports Medicine is actually at the other end of the football field from the training room, essentially. Um, student health uh, has all of that, but we've already started having those conversations of, uh, do we need to have uh, that point of care testing uh, either in our facility or in the athletic training room uh, where the team physicians are able to, to have immediate access to that. And I think that's, 
you know, it, with the with the flu, uh, I think we were okay. We need to be careful with this. I think this is is a whole different animal, uh, and and we're going to have to be uh, way more vigilant and quick in our in our testing. So I, I think that's that's one of the things that's uh, that's coming. I also think that's why it's going to be important for the antibody testing. Um, so if we go and find out that. Uh, reinfection is not really what's happening, that it's a negative test or something like that, then I think having um, the ability to do antibody testing, and again, uh, I'm going at this without knowing the cost of, of any of this stuff, but having the antibody testing and knowing which athletes have tested positive for the antibodies, meaning that they aren't going to get it again, um, then if they come in uh, with a little fever or runny nose, then you can go, okay, I don't have to worry about this as, uh, as this COVID-19. Uh, this may be cold or flu or and go down another, another road, as opposed to someone who you know is antibody negative uh, and you have to immediately isolate them and pull them aside and, and everything in order to protect the other uh, individuals, your team and staff. All right, we'll take a few more. Uh, we are trying to get through them all. Um, let's see. Do you believe that having mass physicals at the high school level would be out of the question? <laughs> um, um, so I, I think it kind of depends upon how we end up defining mass physicals. Um, I think if we're defining mass physicals um, as we're going to take a day um, and we're going to do high school X uh, over an eight hour period and we're slowly bringing them in and through with social distancing and everything, can we do it that way? Yeah, probably there'll be a, a, a way to, to set this up so that, that we can do that. And I think there's going to be some sort of screening at the door um, with temperature checks or something like that so that everybody doing physicals doesn't have to have PPE on and changing it in between every athlete that, that comes through. So I think there's going to be some things that, that we're all going to have to be creative about. I do think you can do it, but you know, the mass physical where, you know, you bring in a team of, you know, 10, 15, 20 healthcare professionals and, you know, you knock out a couple hundred in, in a few hours um, is going to be one that is going to now take all day uh, as opposed to, to a few hours. I, I think there's some ways around it, but you're going to have to be creative. Okay. Um, all right, so this one's for Dr. Smith. With the rumors and reports coming out that the coronavirus being done in a Chinese lab and patient zero working in the lab instead of wet markets, how can this virus be developed in the lab? So um, i first start by saying that there's been a lot of work um, in an attempt to determine the origin of this virus. Um, and there's actually Tulane and Scripps um, and a couple other universities came together and actually published a paper um, regarding this exact question. Um, and what they found looking at the uh, genomic sequence of the virus, as well as looking at um, the uh, x-ray crystall crystallographic structure of the virus and the spike glycoprotein, um, what they found is that it's very unlikely that it was developed in a lab, and it's for a few reasons. Um, one of which is that um, when they looked at the changes, they compared the changes in the 2019 virus to the 2003 SARS coronavirus, which, as I said, they share about 80% homology. Um, the, they found that the residue changes that resulted in increased virulence or increased pathogenicity of this 2019 virus, um, when they modeled those using computer models, the computer models actually suggested that the virus should be less pathogenic. So the idea is that if you were running computer models to determine what residues to change on a virus to make it worse, 
you wouldn't have selected residues that the computer spit out to you telling you do anything to the virus. This may make it less pathogenic. Um, so that's one of the, the things, the things, the, the changes that they observe in the virus don't suggest that it was a result of computer modeling, which is what we molecular biologists use to determine what structures of the virus to change or where to, you know, make genetic changes, genome changes. Um, the other thing is that they've done a substantial work, um, amount of work looking at the phylogeny of the virus. So comparing the genome of this virus to multiple known coronaviruses, and it, it largely suggests that it arose out of uh, that. Um, then there was some intermediate carrier, likely, they, they think, likely maybe a pangolin. Um, and that's exactly what we saw with the 2003 SARS coronavirus. It arose out of the horseshoe bat. It um, was passed to the palm civet and then the palm civet interacted with um, a person. Um, and the palm civet was that immediate intermediate carrier. And they think that that probably happened with the pangolin because there is a lot of viral homology between some pangolin coronaviruses and human coronaviruses. So um, there's been tons of molecular work that's been done to try to figure out from and, and pretty much everything that everybody's reporting is that this didn't, this was not engineered. Um, nature is a beautiful um, selector of uh, uh, individuals that are going to have increased fitness, and by, by that I mean biological fitness, increased ability to reproduce, and she does a better job than any molecular biologist could ever do. All right, um, we'll take one last question and then um, we will look at future events and kind of talk a little bit about um, credit claiming. Um, so I guess this last question, Dr. Stewart, what are the best screenings for student athletes? Should it be tailored for sport um, specifics or should it have generalized OHS, SF, M, A, et cetera, for conditioning, what should the testing be? I'm, I'm gonna go and, and assume that this isn't just on the, uh, the testing for the virus. Uh, I think whatever, so from a virus standpoint, I think that, that the testing that we do is gonna be uniform and it's gonna be something we do across, uh, across all sports um, with regard to that. From the standpoint of kind of uh, how do we test uh, when they get back, whether it's biomechanics or, or something like that, uh, at, at that point, I think it uh, does make some sense to uh, look at uh, a little more sports specific. Um, and I would even say in, uh, in this with some of what we do with uh, NFL Player Care Foundation and, and the research that we do there is we even break football down into big, big skill and skill players. So, and there should probably be a difference uh, because what they do is different. Uh, so, so I could see even within sports having some uh, changes with regard to uh, to what you do from a, from a biomechanical uh, standpoint. But I think virus, mental health, those kinds of things, I think uh, any kind of screening or testing on that is probably uniform. All right. All right, well, thank you to everyone um, that attended the webinar today. I do realize that we did not get to everyone's questions. Um, we will look at the questioning and try to incorporate those in our next webinar. If you have a, a question that you did not get answered, please feel free to email me. My email is down here at the bottom. Um, your question and I will get it to both Dr. Stewart and Dr. Smith and we can get that back to you. Um, also upcoming events, we have two webinars that are coming up. We um, have a webinar that is covering our master's in sports studies. It's informational um, and it's presented by Dr. Lainey Dornier um, and that will be on April 28th. So look for that information. And then Andre Lave, who's one of the physical therapists for the Department of Orthopedics um, at Tulane University will be doing our next uh, webinar that is for um, continuing education unit. So as far as credit claiming process goes, you will receive uh, an email follow-up to this um, 
it will take a little bit of time because to, we have to process the attendee list. So um, it won't be directly after this, but within a day you will receive it and it will have a link for the course assessment and evaluation. Once that's completed, you will be issued a certificate, um, a statement of credit for VOC and a certificate of completion for all other individuals. And if at any time um, you want to stay in contact with us, you see my email address there, but you can also visit the Center for Sport at um, our website. We have our upcoming events there and you can see what's going on in our world. So thank you again to both of our presenters and to all attendees.